Now that we've explored the prokaryotes, the simplest types of cells, we'll now discuss how the first and earliest eukaryotes arose. In this chapter, we'll be exploring some simple types of eukaryotes. The term protist is the informal name given to the diverse group of eukaryotes that are mostly unicellular. Protist is a very diverse and very wide group that's now considered to be too diverse to be included in a single kingdom. Remember also that other eukaryotes include plants, animals, and fungi. Animals are considered to be a single kingdom. So are plants and so are fungi. These eukaryotes will be discussed in later chapters. The earliest eukaryotes were unicellular, and many unicellular eukaryotes exist today. Eukaryotes are different from prokaryotes because they have DNA contained in a nucleus, membrane-bound organelles, and their cellular structure is much more complex than the structure of prokaryotic cells. Scientists have found fossils of eukaryotes that are as old as 1.8 billion years. Now there's also reason to think that eukaryotes existed earlier and that we simply haven't found the earliest fossils of eukaryotes yet. Chemical evidence, such as the molecular clock that we studied in Unit 1, indicates that perhaps eukaryotes arose as early as 2.7 billion years ago. The fossil record shows a rapid increase in the diversity of types of eukaryotes from 1.8 to 1.3 billion years ago. New features of eukaryotes also appeared in the period from 1.3 billion to 635 million years ago. These new features include things like complex multicellularity with cellular specialization and different types of cells that carried out different functions. They also include sexual reproductive life cycles and photosynthesis. The first large multicellular eukaryotes appeared in what are called the Ediacaran biota. This is a group of organisms that evolved between 635 and 535 million years ago. Notice that some of these organisms resemble early plants. DNA evidence indicates that eukaryotes are what we call combination organisms. This means that several different organisms came together and lived in close association with one another, eventually forming a single organism out of several that lived together. Genes in eukaryotes and the characteristics of eukaryotes and several of their types of organelles show evidence that eukaryotes originated from both members of the domain archaea and members of the domain bacteria. This led to the hypothesis of endosymbiosis. Endosymbiosis stated that prokaryotic cells formed a symbiotic relationship. That means that the organisms lived in close association with one another and that one organism was living inside the body or cell of another organism. This sounds a little crazy, but it actually has lots and lots of evidence to support the theory. Scientists hypothesize that serial endosymbiosis 
was responsible for the inclusion of mitochondria into cells before plastids, such as chloroplasts, entered cells through a sequence of endosymbiotic events. So this means that a, an original ancestral prokaryote formed things like the endoplasmic reticulum and the nuclear membrane when pieces of the cell membrane folded inward and broke off to form smaller vesicles inside of the cell. Later, the prokaryotes consumed other prokaryotes that were much smaller. These aerobic bacteria that were swallowed up or ingested but not digested lived inside the prokaryotic cell and became the first mitochondria. This was an advantage to cells that had mitochondria because of the larger amounts of energy that could be produced. Later on in the evolutionary history, some of these cells that already contained mitochondria also engulfed simple photosynthetic prokaryotes. These photosynthetic prokaryotes became the plastids like the chloroplasts found in plant cells. There were other eukaryotes that never gained these plastids and therefore continued to rely on eating other organisms or other materials because they never acquired the photosynthetic ability to make their own food. So the relationship between the cell that consumed the prokaryotic cell and the cell that was consumed was always mutually beneficial. The endosymbiont, or the cell that was swallowed, gained protection from a larger cell and it was much harder for organisms that could digest it to eat it and kill it. The host cell the one that consumed or took up the endosymbiont gained either an increase in energy production or an increase in food production if that was a photosynthetic organism that it consumed. The formation of mitochondria was particularly important because around the time that we start to see the diversification of eukaryotic organisms, we also saw increasing levels of oxygen in the atmosphere and in the water. So if more oxygen was present, anaerobic individuals would be at a disadvantage. Oxygen is actually toxic to many anaerobic organisms. So organisms that could take advantage of this rising levels of oxygen and use it to obtain more energy would have a selective advantage and would increase in the environment. The heterotrophic host cells, those are ones that consumed other organisms for nutrients, benefited if they took up photosynthetic endosymbionts. It's a lot easier to gain food if you can make it yourself inside your own cells. Over time, these cells that were consumed and the cells that served as the host became more and more dependent upon one another, or interdependent. And over time, these organisms were considered a single organism, since neither the host nor the endosymbiont could survive alone. This table here shows some of the probable origins of different features of eukaryotic cells. We have DNA replication enzymes that seem to have originated primarily from members of the domain Archaea. The same goes for transcription enzymes, translation enzymes, and the cell division apparatus, like the spindle fibers and microtubules. 
The endoplasmic reticulum, that network of membranes, appears to have arisen from archaeal cells in some species and bacterial organisms in others. The mitochondria appear to be similar to bacteria, and many metabolic genes appear to have bacterial origins. So this simple phylogeny here that shows the three domains is demonstrating how bacteria entered eukaryotic cells. So even though they didn't share a common ancestor very recently, the eukaryotes could have had features of bacterial cells by taking up the bacterial cells themselves. There's now a lot of evidence that supports the endosymbiotic origin of organelles like mitochondria and plastids. Even though when this hypothesis was first proposed, the person that proposed it was laughed at, and this was considered preposterous or crazy by a lot of scientists. This evidence includes structural similarities between the plasma membranes of prokaryotes and the membranes inside of many eukaryotic cells. Cellular division in many prokaryotes is very similar to the way that these organelles, the mitochondria and the plastids, divide inside of a eukaryotic cell. The structure of DNA found in mitochondria and plastids is also very similar to prokaryotes. In addition to nuclear DNA, eukaryotes also have DNA found in the mitochondria and plastids. Sequencing of this DNA has shown that the DNA sequences in these organelles closely resembles the DNA of certain types of bacteria and certain archaea. These organelles are also capable of transcribing and translating their own DNA independently of the transcription and translation of the nuclear DNA inside the eukaryote. We've also found some structural similarities between the ribosomes of these plastids and the ribosomes of free-living prokaryotic cells. They're much more similar to one another than either is similar to the eukaryotic ribosomes found in the cytoplasm and the endoplasmic reticulum. This diagram shows an example of how primary and secondary endosymbiosis may have occurred. Primary endosymbiosis refers to either a prokaryote engulfing another prokaryote or a simple eukaryote taking on another prokaryote that later became another organelle. Secondary endosymbiosis refers to a eukaryotic cell that engulfed another eukaryote and the eukaryote that was engulfed then became a more complex organelle with a double membrane. This double membrane is potential evidence that supports the theory of secondary endosymbiosis because that engulfing process allows the membrane from the outside of the eukaryote to then encircle the eukaryote that's inside of its cell right now. This double membrane can be seen in certain types of protists, like the dinoflagellates, staminophiles, euglenids, and chloroarachnidophytes.